Kansas City, Missouri is famous for culture, jazz, and barbecue, but it is also the birthplace of a sporting tale that changed both the face of sport and wider society in the United States. Baseball is America's pastime. The sport is loved and revered right across this land, but there was a time when if you look like me, you couldn't have stood here. We're gonna tell the story of segregation, intimidation, and fear, and how in the end, it turned into integration and triumph. This is the story of American baseball's Negro Leagues. The story of the Negro Leagues is America at her worst, but also America at her triumph at best. The part of the story that I think is most important is the triumph. It doesn't reflect well upon us. What happened to them is not right. They suffered a lot. If you allow a black to play with you, you can't play with us. There's a lot of sadness along the way. They could have easily said, forget about it but they refuse to succumb to that. You really do need to share this story. I love this story. That story has to go on and on. They didn't care about making history. They just wanted to play ball. It was a great American shame. It changed our country for the better. Life in the late 19th century and early 1900s in America was tough for a black man. With echoes of slavery, it was a life of segregation, degradation, and of being considered more beast than human being. Sport mirrored society. Everything was segregated, baseball included. So some of the greatest African Americans and Hispanic baseball players did not have a place to showcase their world-class baseball abilities. They were shunned away from the major leagues, although there are some early instances where perhaps a few players of color snuck on teams, were not recognized, and then eventually were discovered and then kicked off those teams. Moses Fleetwood Walker is one that comes to mind playing on what we would call a major league team going back to the late 1800s, about 1883. Yeah, it didn't last long before a guy named Cap Anson, Adrian Cap Anson and others led, quote unquote, a gentleman's agreement that would ban blacks from playing on white major league teams. There was never any written doctrine, just a verbalized agreement amongst players, managers and owners that essentially said, if you allow a black to play with you, you can't play with us. We're not particularly proud of that particular part of our history. It doesn't reflect well upon us, but it's part of the American story. We are not living up to our principles. We're not living up to the creed of America. And you can see it in baseball, and you can see it in the baseball story. It didn't start off well. It is such an embarrassing time in this country's history. Unfortunately, pigmentation drove a lot of fear in our society. Yeah, we never looked at the individual. We never looked at the content of his character, as Dr. Martin Luther King would so eloquently say. We just looked at one's skin color and then made a determination about their abilities, about their cognitive senses, uh, about everything of, about that particular individual. And, and we know that that's a ridiculous assertion. But change was on the way and it happened in the unassuming surroundings of the Paseo YMCA, just a stone's throw from the epicenter of Kansas City's African-American community in the 1920s. Fast forward almost a century, and amazingly, the building is still here and looks pretty much the same. But this is no ordinary building. It holds the secret of a long-forgotten tale key to baseball's story in this country. And through these doors stepped a group of men who were to change the face of baseball forever. The Negro National Baseball League, the first professional long-lasting baseball league started right here. In uh, February of, uh, this would be 1920, they were wanting to form a league and originally the meeting was scheduled for Indianapolis. But for some reason, which I never discovered, they moved it to Kansas City and that allowed everyone to come to Kansas City and this historic building that still survives uh, is where they had the meeting. So it brought together all of the great Negro League owners from the West. The main architect was Andrew Rube Foster, a former talented pitcher in his own right, but it was away from the baseball diamond where he made a telling impact on the sport, a visionary, 
a man years ahead of his time, without whom baseball would not look as it does today. I don't think it's an exaggeration or a stretch to consider Root Foster the most influential figure in baseball history, modern baseball history. Root Foster is best recognized for being this innovative leader, this great manager. He, he spanned the gamut in, in terms of every aspect of baseball that he impacted. And of course, he would organize the Negro Leagues here in Kansas City. They needed Root Foster to make the league. He controlled the Detroit Stars, he controlled the Cuban Giants, and he controlled his own team, which was the Chicago American Giants. They had to work a deal with Root Foster. And so in, in doing that, they guaranteed Root Foster, by giving up your agency and bringing these teams in, we're going to pay you 10% of every Negro League game played. And all that was negotiated right here in this building. And it became the first lasting Negro League. It wasn't the first attempt, but it was the first lasting. And really, it changed the course of baseball history. Parks are gone. The hotels they've stayed at, they're all gone. The ball players are gone, but this building remains, and it's important that we take care of it. If a black man wanted to play baseball or any other professional sport, he played in the Negro Leagues or he didn't play. It was not necessarily a dwelling on the adversity, but overcoming the adversity. So you won't let me play with you? Put my own league together. Yeah, and now my league gonna be just as good as your league. And, and in many instances, it was. They were outdrawing Major League Baseball in many cities across this country of ours. One thing that the Negro Leagues did out of pure necessity, not because they necessarily wanted to, is they went everywhere across the country. Major League Baseball was very limited. So two thirds of the country had no access to the highest level baseball. The Negro Leagues traveled everywhere. They went everywhere that they were welcome. And, and there's a, a very uh, kind of odd thing. They used to call many of the Negro Leagues teams and the black teams that were in the lower levels were called the Giants. And the Giants was word, it was, it was code word for this is a black team. They had their own company teams, their factory teams, but they didn't have this kind of high quality baseball coming. So white people and black people alike wanted to see this baseball. Even the lovely ladies flocked to the parks to boo and cheer. Yes, there's no doubt about it, baseball is king. It's a game where the Negro athlete of today and yesteryear has left a bright mark. They were playing a far more exciting brand of baseball, which so ironically drew white fans who came to watch them play. <laughs> so coming out of segregation, they actually put black and white together. They put black and white together. Oftentimes, if black fans were allowed in to watch a major league game, we were separated by a chicken wire barrier. So black fans would sit down the left or right field lines. We would then be separated from white fans who sat in the rest of the ballpark. But in, at Negro League games, we sat side by side, watching truthfully the best baseball being played in this country, again, with no, without question the most exciting brand of baseball being played. And they filled stadium upon stadium, but I gather Sundays were pretty special. Just Ooh. tell us why. S Sunday in the Negro Leagues. Oh, it was special. It was special because of the pageantry of it. And black churches would move their service time up an hour so fans could go to the game. Now, for those there in your part of the world, that's big time, that's big. Because if you know anything about the black church, you don't mess with service time. Here in this country, it was 11 o'clock, Sunday go to meeting, as they would say. But when the Negro Leagues, in Negro League cities, particularly here in Kansas City, that church service would start at 10 o'clock, and everybody left church going to that Sunday double header, dressed to the nines, looking good. It was a tremendous experience. Here where we are at 18th and Vine, when the Monarchs would open the season here, a marching band would lead them from here to 22nd in Brooklyn where the stadium is, and behind them, 17,000 plus fans, standing room only. Standing room only to see the great Kansas City Monarchs play. Here in this rare footage is a glimpse of life in the other baseball league. A season of long, tiring bus trips, three and four games in a day. And in the South, no service in white-only restaurants and no rooms in white hotels. 
segregation was both the law and custom of the land, and no group was more scrupulous in its observance of custom than organized baseball. It was tough. It, it, the conditions in this country were tough. Matter of fact, it was so tough that they found sanctuary playing in other countries, and they're treated like heroes. So we're talking, they're staying in the finest hotels, eating in the finest restaurants. Come back home, and now you're treated like a second-class citizen. I remember uh, interviewing a guy named Piper Davis, played for Birmingham, and uh, he told me that he was with the team, and he was traveling, and they had nowhere to stay, and the only place that was large enough to house the old, whole team was the jail, so they put them in jail for that night. The difficulties were not on the baseball field, but the difficulties were as they were traveling the highways and byways of our country, not knowing where they could get a meal. And sometimes they would go into a ballpark, fill up the ballpark, but couldn't get a meal from the same fans who had just cheered them, or they wouldn't have a place to stay. So they would have to sleep on the bus and eat their peanut butter and crackers. You just couldn't just go into a restaurant and order a meal. So many times after a game, they would play a game and say maybe they're playing a small town. And uh, what they would have to do is after the game, when all the customers are gone, they would let them come in as a team and eat. Their reputations had preceded them. Those fans were expecting to see a good game. I don't care if you rode the bus all night. We heard about y'all. We heard y'all could play. Show me what you got. Yeah, you know, and so that's what, that was that mindset. So they had to overcome all that. You have to perform no matter what. They were every bit as good as the major leagues. As baseball fans, we were cheated. Did they want to play in the big leagues? I'm sure they did. It was just a flood of talent like baseball has never seen before and never seen since. Fear had as much to do with this as anything. Come spring, and the old refrain, take me out to the ball game, echoes across America from the western to the eastern seaboard. All leagues are alternately booed and cheered by spectators who sit in the stands eating millions of hot dogs. The emergence of the Negro Leagues gave a whole generation of talented black ball players a chance to showcase their talents, but not on the greatest stage of all. The major leagues were still out of reach. As baseball fans, we were cheated. Yeah, we should have seen all the best players take the field at the same time. How much better would our sport have been if the doors had opened sooner? And I can tell you, and I say this with no uncertainty, had the doors opened sooner, the record books in Major League Baseball would be completely different. They were every bit as good as the Major Leagues. The very highest levels of the Negro Leagues were equal or better. The African-American teams the, and the Major League teams would play in all-star games uh, during the uh, offseason to make some extra money. And the black teams won a huge percentage of these games. The history books bear out that the Negro League teams or the black all-star teams won almost 75% of those head-to-head -head matchups. So there was never a, any doubt about their ability to play in the Major League. Social conditions of our times in this country and fear. And I can tell you right now, Fear had as much to do with this as anything. And, and the fear comes from that average major, major leaguer who was so concerned about this influx of black and Hispanic talent come in. Because if they come in, I might lose my job. It was just a flood of talent like baseball has never seen before and never seen since. In some ways, I guess it was fitting that they did create their own league. And now we can bring that story to the forefront uh, and, and introduce them to these great athletes of, of yesteryear. You know, these athletes that you should have known about. You see, the beauty of Major League Baseball is that even if you don't know the history of the Major Leagues, you can pretty much go almost anywhere and learn that history. Can't do that with the history of the Negro Leagues. Yeah, it was literally going to be lost to time. Many Negro League players never realized their dreams. They never made it into the big leagues. Some did though, and the first to be inducted into Major League Baseball's Hall of Fame was Leroy Robert Page. But everybody knew him as Satchel. Satchel Page, in many ways, was the Negro Leagues. He was that big. He, he was that big. Satchel Page was a star among stars. He was the brightest of those stars. If Satchel Page was performing today, he probably, with the era, the advent of social media, 
He'd be the biggest star on the face of the planet. He had that kind of persona, arguably the greatest pitcher this sport has ever seen. He really played for almost every team in the, in the, in the, the Negro Leagues over time because he was such an important drawing card that he would sort of be shared in a way around. There will never, ever, ever be another Leroy Satchel Page. And in many ways, he's the measuring stick. So you'll hear other guys say, well, you know, such and such was as good as Satchel. But when you that measuring stick that everybody else is measuring up against, you must be pretty special. As an old man and past his best, Satchel Page made it into the majors. Many others weren't so lucky. Josh Gibson, known as the Black Babe Ruth, regarded as perhaps the best power hitter and catcher of all time didn't get there, nor did Cool Papa Bell, who's considered the fastest man to ever don a pair of baseball cleats. Cool was cool, and, and Cool is still believed to be the fastest man to ever play this game. Clocked him in an amazing 12 seconds, circling the bases from home to home. His good friend, Satchel Page, would say of Cool that he was so fast that he could walk in a room, turn off the lights, get in bed, pull up the covers before the room went dark. Did they get to play in the big leagues? No. Did they want to play in the big leagues? I'm sure they did because they wanted to play at the high, what was considered the highest level. Uh, a lot of them certainly could have and had the skill to do so, but they built that bridge so others could. It took 27 years. It wasn't until 1947 when the first across that bridge was college graduate Jackie Robinson. Was he the best player in the Negro Leagues? And the answer is no. No, he wasn't. There were other Negro League veterans who were far superior baseball players to Jackie at that time. But Jackie absolutely was the right man to be the first because he had what I like to refer to as the intangibles that better prepared him to deal with the racial hatred. Some of those other Negro League players who had been so acclimated to segregation, they couldn't have handled the social aspect of this. They would have crumbled under the weight of that social adversity. So, and as you well know, the first guy cannot fail. There was tremendous name calling, uh, teammates shunning him, death threats, all of those things that you would see as sort of from the outside. One team tried to start a league-wide strike uh, against him. They knocked him down continuously. He would slide into second base and sometimes come up wet where the opposition had spit on him. When the opposition slid in the second, they came in spikes out trying to cut him. They did everything imaginable to break Jackie. I think the toughest part though, even beyond sort of the name calling and all of this was that there was tremendous, tremendous pressure on him to succeed. We all owe a great deed of gratitude to the courage of Jackie Robinson, who withstood so tremendously and performed so courageously with the weight of 21 million black folks on his back. Because if he fails, an entire race of people would have failed. We should never forget Jackie Robinson. No, nor should we forget the league that gave us Jackie Robinson. Because if it's not for the Negro Leagues, we don't get Jackie Robinson. While Jackie Robinson's breakthrough was a key moment in baseball, it spelt the beginning of the end of the Negro Leagues. The best black players were now recruited by the Major League teams, and that resulted in the Negro Leagues folding in 1960. Gone, but not forgotten, thanks to Buck O'Neill, a former player, the first African-American Major League scout and coach who was determined never to let the memory of the Negro Leagues die. He's, he's extraordinarily important. He's important enough that there is one statue in the Baseball Hall of Fame, and it's a statue of Buck O'Neill. He became the voice of the Negro Leagues. He was evangelizing his wonderful story and how proud they were of what they had done. He wanted to go everywhere and talk about the game, celebrate the game, tell stories about the game. So, so he was, he was uh, a one-man, uh, you know, a barker for the game. He kept alive these memories. These memories were really, you look at the late 1960s, early 1970s, Nobody wanted to talk about the Negro Leagues. It was a shame, right? It was a great American shame. And even Negro Leagues players who were still alive then didn't really want to talk about that time. Buck was the person who said, no, there's a lot to be proud of here. There's a lot to tell. There's not just pain. There's also this wonderful triumph. And so that was a big thing. And that's part of the healing that baseball has, has, uh, has had for the last 
40, 50 years, Buck O'Neill was at the center of that healing. It was in the vibrant jazz district of 18th and Vine in Kansas City that Buck O'Neill left his lasting legacy. He was one of the founders of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. He wanted a place to showcase the great ball players of the past to make sure in the present, those men were never forgotten. You're going to meet some of the greatest baseball players to ever put on a baseball uniform. But by the time you walk away from this experience, I truly believe that you walk away with a greater appreciation how, how special this country really is. Buck has been gone for 12 years now. So that's a bunch of kids who never got to know Buck O'Neill in any way, shape, or form. So I think that the museum sees itself as the extension of Buck. And this story, it's, it's such an important part of American, it's such an important part of sports. He wanted people to know that story. He, he wanted to build this museum so that they would be remembered, so that their story would not be lost to time, so that this piece of history would not die when that last Negro Leaguer left the face of this earth. They paved the way for us and uh, they suffered a lot. They worked hard, they never gave up. And that's what they instilled upon me as a player when I made it to the major leagues. That story has to go on and on for all the generations coming along. It's history, I mean, sometimes people don't like to relive history because it hurts and it's painful, uh, but it's real. And, and these guys not only endured it, they also came through an era of racism and discrimination and, and they still play through it. Those guys build a bridge where I can cross over the bridge and play in the major league. So I am uh, grateful for what they did and the sacrifice they made. So a guy like me, and even now, that uh, can reap some of the benefits of being at the highest level of baseball, and that's a major show. I don't think it w would have been possible without that, without their sacrifices. And uh, I don't really know if too many guys nowadays playing this game can realize the sacrifice they went through and what the guys are making today. We celebrate the great players now. We celebrate the African-American players who have come along, the Willie Mays, the Harry Garens, the Barry Bonds, the, the great, great, great players. We should also celebrate the people who built the bridge. And that's what this place is, the people who built the bridge, some of them with their lives, some of them in great pain, some of them triumphantly, but they are the ones that made all of this happen. So to me, it's a very much a triumphant story. That to me is what makes this so special. Yeah, they could have easily said, forget about it. This is too hard. I'm not going to do this. I ju we just won't play. But they refuse to succumb to that. And to me, that's why the story is so triumphant in its nature. Yeah, because you rise above all of that. Yeah, you refuse to accept the notion that you're unfit to do anything, so I'll show you. All of that is embodied inside this story, along with these amazingly gifted athletes who just wanted to play ball. In the midst of all this, they didn't care about all this other stuff that I'm talking about. They didn't care about making history. They just wanted to play ball. But again, the passion, the pride, the determination, the perseverance that they demonstrated in the face of adversity would not only change our sport, it changed our country for the better. This place is eerie. It's almost ghost-like. It evokes memories of men long gone whose dreams, like those of Oscar Charleston here, were never fulfilled. One swing, he used to say, just give me one swing in the majors. Well, he was good enough, but he never got it. But that doesn't mean he was a failure, because every time a black man steps up to the plate in Major League Baseball today, he can only do that because of Oscar and the thousands like him who came before and paved the way. These men aren't ghosts. Their spirit is very much alive. Thank you.